Thanks, Wendy, and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know that uh, Dr. Pardol has given you a nice introduction to the immune system. Have you already heard a lot about how the immune system uh, interacts with cancer cells? And you'll hear more in the afternoon about specific cancers. But I'm going to give you a little bit of background to this question about why is the immune therapy more effective in some cancers than others. So as an initial background, this is how we envision that the immune system might interact with cancers. Tumors would have these Got the pointer here, okay. Tumors would have these proteins that get released or pieces of proteins that get released that we call antigens that get picked up by these cells which are antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells and they express these pieces of proteins on a receptor on their surface that allows them to be recognized by immune cells or lymphocytes in the lymph node. And when an immune cell, together with this second signal, recognizes this protein on or peptide on the surface of this antigen presenting cell, it starts to divide and become activated and hopefully then finds its way back to the tumor that has this same peptide on it and starts to make other proteins called cytokines, which activate the immune cells and things from its granules called granzyme and perforin, which can destroy the tumor cells. So that's our view of how it should work. And if it worked that way, we wouldn't have cancer that we'd know about it get defeated in two weeks, the same way we defeat viral infections and you'd never know that you had a tumor. And maybe people are getting tumors all the time and they're being defeated by this approach. But we know that um, tumors do happen. And so um, there are many ways in which the tumors can potentially get around this. And they're studying this. There are two different sort of approaches that cancers take that help us help inform us as to who might be the best candidates to treat with particular therapies. So some tumors don't have, either through um, not having these peptides or through um, not making these uh, various signals that we call chemokines that might attract cells, immune cells once they've been recognized to, uh, once they recognize these peptides uh, that the cancer has, or by creating through maybe fibroblast proliferation within the tumor a physical barrier to the immune cells from actually seeing the cancer cells are have essentially protect themselves. They're essentially not able to be recognized or killed by uh, activated immune cells. And some of those tumors, which may include tumors that may vary, that we would consider uh, unlikely to respond to immune therapy, um, maybe tumors such as pancreatic cancer or um, some types of breast cancer, um, are well defended and may never respond. On the other hand, there are other sets of tumors that have all the right constituents to allow for this immune reaction to happen. They have these peptides. They have chemokines that are being made that attract the immune cells to the tumor. And um, the, uh, the immune tumor expresses the protein so that the immune cells could potentially kill it. And those tumors, if they're growing, have to come up with another way of defeating that immune response. And this is where the immune checkpoints or the breaks come in. And so identifying those tumors that have immune infiltrates um, 
and have various um, immune regulatory factors that are upregulated and who have these proteins on the surface that can be recognized by the immune system is what we're trying to do to identify the patients who would re best respond to immune therapy. So three factors. Things on the surface that are unique and can be recognized by the immune system. Things that attract immune cells into the tumor. And things that have adaptively shut off the function of those immune cells are the type of tumors that we think will respond to immune therapy. And that may represent a large subset of certain tumors, such as melanoma, but not all of them, or no subset of, of certain tumors. And trying to sort that out is the work of trying to address the question that I was asked to address. So I got into immune therapy by giving interleukin-2, and we saw 10 to 25% of patients respond to interleukin-2, and about 10% had durable responses. And what we probably think happens is these are patients who can do all of the um, steps of this particular um, uh, immune algorithm, and they can get immune cells into the tumor, but they have a defect in their immune regulation, meaning that they don't have good T regulatory cells or the brakes of their immune system don't work, and therefore when they get a driver like interleukin-2, the immune cells expand more than the regulatory cells expand, and then their tumors go away. But that's only a subset of patients with a rare set of tumors, so we needed better, better approaches to this. One approach that um, was initially started by Steve Rosenberg and colleagues at the National Cancer Institute was to take these immune cells which were in the tumor, these CD8 lymphocytes, and to take them out of the tumor and grow them up outside of this immunosuppressive environment, and then eliminate all these immunosuppressive factors by giving high doses of chemotherapy, and then give the patient back a new immune system. And that, as uh, Dr. Topalian certainly was involved in these initial studies, could produce dramatic results in a subset of patients, patients who got complete responses, which represented as many as 20 or 30 percent of the total patient population had very durable responses. But this was a very complex approach. It involved um, technical uh, skills of taking these immune cells, identifying which were the right ones, expanding them, and giving patients toxic chemotherapy, uh, to get rid of all these um, breaks on the immune system and then giving these cells back together with interleukin-2 to keep them alive. And so there was wondering, could we activate these immune cells inside the tumor microenvironment? And that's where the uh, understanding all these co-inhibitory and co-stimulatory factors that were talked about by Dr. Pardal and Dr. Luke come into play. And it turns out the two master Immunoinhibitory factors are CTLA-4 uh, and PD-1 on the surface of the lymphocytes binding to their um, uh, ligands or binding to proteins on the surface of uh, tumor cells or antigen-presenting cells. So having antibodies that block that, those particular interactions, we hoped, and it turns out is actually happening, is activating those immune cells that have been exhausted or have been inactivated by the immune microenvironment, restoring their activity and restoring the anti-tumor effects. So this is just uh, a cartoon of how this works. This is an immune cell that has managed to find its way into the tumor microenvironment on its surface it has PD-1 because it's activated. When it sees an antigen on the surface of the tumor cell, it makes <clears throat> interferon, which is one of those cytokines used to try to kill the tumor cell. When the interferon interacts with the tumor cell, the tumor cell puts on its surface PD-L1, which binds to PD-1 
and shuts off the immune function of that T cell. And giving an antibody that blocks that interaction can restore that function selectively within the tumor. And as I, I think has been discussed and you'll hear more about later, this is working in a lot of different tumors, not just melanoma and kidney cancer, which are the tumors that are responsive to interleukin-2, but tumors that we never even thought had enough immune cells in them that could actually be responsive to immune therapy, such as non-small cell lung cancer, bladder cancer, head and neck cancers, lymphomas, maybe other cancers. <clears throat> 